I think you know data is critical. So you know all the work we do should be evidence based. Um, I think we've come to learn that you know opinion and uh, anecdote is not good enough. We have to have data, um, and there's often a call for data from various policymakers to base their planning. But I think the critical caveat is that we will always look at the data critically. You know, what was the source of it? Uh, can we believe in the, the methods, are there biases, is there confounding? Um, are the results generalizable to the general population? Are they practical, are they feasible? Uh, I think that's particularly important with mathematical modeling where there are numerous parameters and sometimes it's not clear uh, which parameters were put in the model, what were the limitations of the parameters. Um, how much sensitivity analysis there was around the, <coughs> the uncertainty. And just looking at the headline results and making conclusions on that without an underlying deep understanding of the model uh, can, be, can be a problem. I think scientists know that, but sometimes policymakers don't. And I think it's the job of scientists to explain to policymakers that they have to look at everything with a very critical eye before making any decisions. The 1090 gap is, is uh, a historical um, statement that I used in my, my presentation. Um, it's true to an extent that you know, a large proportion of research funding is used uh, for a small proportion of the global health problems. Um, I think the 1090 gap was established or, or was first coined you know, in the 1990s. Uh, now that's less true. There's a lot more funding for um, global health initiatives and for focusing on the diseases of poverty. Um, partly that's a result of the advocacy from the 1090 campaign. So I think um, the important ways to change this is to continue advocating both for the, um, the political and the economic arguments that uh, you know, health research in developing countries and diseases of poverty is a global public health good. And that actually um, you know, there's a global solidarity with increasing globalisation and by improving the health of the poorest in the world actually we will we will uh, have benefits globally, both in terms of economic development, um, health and welfare of the whole populations. Those structural barriers, like the intellectual property laws and, and um, uh, research regulations, they, they, they were created for a purpose. They were created to, to protect people. Uh, the intellectual property rights were to protect the value of people's ideas and also to partly uh, stimulate creation and innovation so that if people had ideas, um, they saw the value of those ideas and it, it, it stimulated innovation. Uh, so they have a very good, important value, but I think it's, it's balancing that value with the negative consequences, which can be um, to bring an imbalance in certain ways so that we saw this very well demonstrated with the problem of virus sharing for influenza vaccines where there was intellectual property um, protection by vaccine companies whereas the, the poorer countries that were providing the viruses felt that there was no protection of their own benefits. Um, so I think they're necessary uh, but sometimes the balance is not right and what we have to do is to continue um, the debate and the dialogue to make sure we, we shift that balance both in terms of um, making sure there's adequate benefits from intellectual property recognition and also making sure that uh, research ethics regulation is calibrated to the level of risk of the research so that research that is lower risk has lower levels of regulation than research which is higher risk. Mm -hmm.